All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at this time, we are recording uh, our first task force meeting. Uh, hopefully, you are in the right place. This is the Maryland um, Non-Public School Transportation Task Force. Uh, my name is Gabriel Rose. Uh, I'll provide some introductions uh, shortly then, but uh, briefly, uh, I am your chair for this task force that has been identified by legislation that we'll talk about. And I am the State Director of Pupil Transportation here for the State Department of Education. Uh, so I will uh, go and do introductions shortly, as I said. But to start off, I just wanted to welcome you all to this, um, this meeting. I thank you all for participating in this task force uh, and I look forward to working with all of you over the next few meetings that we'll be having. Uh, so as we go into our meeting today, I'm going to give you an overview of what our accomplishments will be. Uh, the first is to understand what is bringing us all together. We'll talk about what the non-public school transportation task force is. We're going to be talking about the legislation uh, that was uh, passed this past session. Uh, and Delegate Attar has, um, uh, is able to provide an, an overview of uh, what brought us all together and the goal of the task force. Um, the main goal today is to give you all uh, an equal understanding of student transportation in Maryland. So we'll be talking about the current status of public school transportation that I'll be presenting. Uh, we'll also discuss current understanding of non-public school transportation in Maryland as well. So we can see both forms of uh, school transportation in Maryland. We'll have a brief discussion on state funding, uh, how these programs are run uh, and funded by state and local uh, municipalities. I'll give a brief overview of what our other state partners are doing, what other programs our states have, um, so we can start the discussion on um, looking at recommendations uh, and looking at how things that other states are using might impact our operations here in Maryland. And lastly, we'll talk about a survey that will be sent out, or that I'm sorry, that has been sent out uh, that we are going to use to gather information from our non-public schools and public schools on transportation programs that they use currently in the state of Maryland. So before we get into our discussions, I just want to make sure everyone knows how to use this form, or this platform. Um, we'll be using Google Meets consistently for our four meetings. Uh, but just to let you know that you all have the ability to mute and unmute your phones. Uh, at the bottom left of your screen, you'll see a mute and unmute button with your uh, microphone icon. Uh, if you wish to talk, feel free to unmute. Uh, when you are, uh, when you've completed your thought or conversation, please mute yourself again so that we don't have feedback from other uh, talk, uh, other presenters or other members. Uh, video on and off. Uh, obviously, if you need to go accomplish something else and, and you need to turn your video off, that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's the icon right next to your mute button. Uh, because this is a virtual meeting, uh, we will not have any in-person meetings due to the um, spread of our state uh, and, and the distance that people would have to travel. So we'll be doing everything virtually. Uh, to accomplish that, if you would like to uh, talk about a certain topic or if you have a question, uh, the icon of the hand, uh, that will help me identify who would like to talk so that we don't have people talking over each other. Uh, that's a, a, a helpful part for me to, to keep track of as we go through our meetings. Uh, if you do have anything that you'd like to uh, send out to the group in terms of messaging, questions, or comments, on the bottom right of your screen, you should see what looks like a test me text message icon. Uh, that will bring up your chat, and you can talk with all members at the same time. Uh, that will also be saved for later use, uh, just to make sure that we answered all questions that any of the members had. Uh, and lastly, um, this recording of the video, as long, along with all communications of text messaging, not text messaging, but messaging, will be saved uh, for future use for minutes uh, and will also be posted to the web. Uh, the video will be posted to the web so that our members of the public can view it if they'd like. So as part of that, I just need to briefly discuss the Open Meetings Act requirement. Uh, Maryland Open Meeting Act is a statute that requires that state and local bodies hold their meetings in public to give the public adequate notice of these meetings and to allow the public to inspect meeting minutes. The act permits public bodies to discuss some topics of confidentiality. The act's goals are to increase the public's faith in government, ensure the accountability of government to the public, and enhance the public's ability to participate effectively in our democracy. As such, the recording will be stored and posted later on the MSD website for the public to view if interested. 
and minutes will be taken and sent out to members no later than a week prior to the following meeting. Uh, before the conclusion of our meeting today, we'll be talking about the next steps for future presenters, uh, members of the public that we would uh, would like to have uh, join in, uh, but just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of the Meeting Act requirement. All right. So this is where we all get to introduce ourselves. Um, we'll be testing out our microphone's capabilities. So I'll start with myself uh, as Gabriel Rose. As I said, I'm the director for the Office of People Transportation Emergency Management here at MSDE. And I'll just go around the virtual room. I'll move to our other MSDE representative, Mr. Justin Dayhoff, to introduce himself. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for kicking us off here, Gabe. Pleasure to be on the task force. My name is Justin Dayhoff, Assistant State Superintendent, Financial Planning, Operations, and Strategy here at MSDE. All right. Thank you, Justin. Uh, and Delegate uh, Atar. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Delegate Dahlia Atar. You'll be hearing from me shortly, uh, but I'm the one that sponsored the bill this past session, and that's why we are here together today. Thank you all. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate uh, Courtney Watson. Not hearing anything from Delegate Watson. Uh, we'll move to Senator Shelby uh, Hedelman. Hi, it's Shelby Hedelman. I'm Senator from District 11 in Baltimore County. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be on here for a short time. I'm technically on vacation. Uh, this week, but I wanted to join just in the beginning, and um, my very able and wonderful Chief of Staff, Mara Dunnigan, is also on to cover for me. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, and we appreciate you taking time out of your vacation to join us here today as well. Uh, well uh, Senator uh, Paul Quarterman. Uh, hello there. Yes, uh, Senator Quarterman, I represent District 2, which is out in Western Maryland, uh, basically the eastern half of Washington County, a little bit of Frederick County. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Senator Quarterman. I'll move to our M, uh, our MVA or uh, MDOT representative, uh, Mr. Daryl Clark. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Daryl Clark. I am the Director of Service Development here at MDOT MTA. Um, in my department, we do uh, bus alignment, scheduling, bus stops, and some transit systems. So happy to be here. Hopefully we get this done. We work well together and we can, you know, make something positive happen. All right. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, we'll go to uh, Ms. Shakira Bolden. Not hearing anything from Ms. Bolden. Uh, Ms. Lynn Harris. All right. Uh, we'll move on to Mr. Kenny West. Not here. Oh, Mr. Kenny West just posted that the firewall is being blocked, both video and audio, but working on resolving. Uh, so Mr. West is here, uh, and I'll just give his brief introduction until he joins. Uh, he is our representative from Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, he has worked up there in the transportation office um, throughout all ranks that I'm, I'm aware of, uh, and is very knowledgeable in public school transportation up in our Baltimore County region. All right, moving on, we, uh, Mr. Steve Nelson. Good afternoon, Steve Nelson, uh, Nelson School Bus company out of uh, Forest Hill in Harker County. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Ms. Ariel Frank Frankston. Okay. Hi. I'm so thrilled to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so I work with Jewish day schools across the state um, together with others on this call and advocating for non-public schools. My, um, my office also has operations in neighboring states and other states across the country. And we focus a lot on uh, policy and structure of different programs. So very excited to bring uh, many of those pieces to this task force. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move to Jeremy Joseph. Yes, I'm uh, Jeremy Joseph. I'm the principal at Archbishop Curley High School in Baltimore. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Uh, and Ann Wagner. Hello, uh, my name is Ann Wagner. I am the brand new head of school at the Banner School in Frederick. Uh, we're currently moving from one location to another within a very short month, um, but I'm very happy to be part of this task force. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Uh, there's one more representative that we are waiting uh, to be uh, assigned. Uh, our second representative from associations rep representing non-public schools, 
Uh, so we will uh, look to get a representative quickly before our next meeting. Some other members that I just wanted to introduce to you, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Talor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Krishna Talor, Deputy State Superintendent for Office of Operations. Um, here to assist Gabe and uh, the task force in uh, in any coordination required from MSDE. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Akila uh, Lane. Akila will be joining us um, in just a moment, uh, but I can introduce our team in general. Um, so I work with, with Dr. Aline um, on the Government Affairs Education Policy and External Relations team here at MSDE, so it's it's nice to meet you all. All right. Thank you, Laura. And are there any members that are on the line that we didn't hear from or introduce themselves? Mr. O'Day. Mr. O'Day may have hung up by accident. Uh, Mr. Saldwin. I believe you. Good afternoon, yeah. everybody. Uh, this is Rabbi Ariel Sadwin from Agudath Israel of Maryland and Maryland Cape. Um, pleased to be on here with all of you, and thanks for everyone's uh, shared work. Uh, I've been working on private school busing in the Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Northwest Baltimore, Pikesville area for about 16 years. Uh, I've worked closely with uh, the MTA uh, on a root system that we've had in place going back a number of years that goes to four school campuses. Uh, we've done some surveying of, uh, of local households in this area, District 11, District 41, uh, within the year about uh, you know the, the joint interest uh, and feelings about uh, the school transportation in general and some of the specifics, uh, which I'm sure will come up in the conversations. And I am, again, appreciative of the beer. All right. Thank you. I see uh, Mr. O'Day has joined. Yeah, sorry about that. How are you doing? Apologize for being in the car coming back from our opening schools uh, convocation, uh, as was Mr. Joseph, too, as well. So I'm Garrett O'Day, Deputy Director of Maryland Catholic Conference. I represent the uh, 50,000 um, Catholic school students in the state of Maryland, as well as the non-public school coalition with Rabbi Sadlin, Maryland Cape. So thanks very much for having us today. All right. Thank you all. All right. So I hear all microphones work, so we're off to a good start on that. Uh, just to give everyone uh, a view of where we're going from here today, uh, this is the first of our four meetings. Um, you should have all received the calendar invites for the following three. Just as a reminder, our next meeting will be September 14th, following that September 28th and October 17th. Just so you know, each meeting has a different uh, Google Meets login. Uh, so whatever you use today will not be used the next time we meet. Uh, so just a heads up on that and we'll give more information at the conclusion of our meeting. So to start off um, our meeting, I'd like uh, for Mr. Uh, Deputy Talor to provide some opening remarks for the group. Thank you, Gabe. Um, as I shared in my introduction, my remarks will be very brief. As I shared in the introduction, me here representing uh, MSDE, uh, I work closely with Gabe um, in the operations. Um, my role would be to be a facilitator and, uh, and, and assist the task force in any kind of coordination or activities as needed. Um, as we know, uh, the, the work ahead of us is in a, in a compressed timeline uh, for the report that's due uh, before we know it. So uh, the coming meetings uh, will be more focused in terms of discussion, feedback, and the recommendations that we are going to gather. Uh, and uh, that will form the basis for the report. Um, it will be a collaborative process, uh, and uh, we continue to uh, look forward to continue to working with all of you. Thank you, Gabe. You are on mute, sir. Thank you. Even I still make mistakes with that. Uh, thank you, Krishna. Um, and I'll just provide some brief remarks for myself as well. Um, uh, so I've been working with school transportation here in Maryland for about, I'm going to say, 10 years, uh, seven years as the state director. Uh, and I've been working with our national association uh, for that entire time. So I've known what other states 
are doing with their student populations. Uh, I've worked through NTSB investigations with Baltimore City's accident. Uh, we've been part of a lot of um, work internally on getting our public school systems to be uh, to a high standard of student safety. And I think that uh, I'm pleased and honored to be chairing this, this uh, task force uh, and to not only work on recommendations, but to learn as well uh, from our non-public school members, the uh, difficulties or the uh, the parameters that you all work within uh, for your transportation programs. Um, the goal here is that this is a task force that is going to be starting out with learning um, about the status of transportation in Maryland. Uh, this is going to be a completely open discussion. Uh, there's not going to be any leaning to one way or the other from my office. We will be an independent um, uh, chair uh, to make sure that you all have an equal opportunity to discuss uh, ask questions uh, and provide recommendations uh, for the final report. Uh, so again, I thank you all. If there's anything that you have questions about, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but at this point, uh, we'll move into why we're all here. So uh, before Delegate Attar provides uh, some historical background on this, I want to set the stage for what the group will be doing. Uh, the task force deliverable uh, will be uh, at the conclusion of these four meetings to make recommendations regarding methods by which the state, Maryland, may support the reduction in use of passenger vehicles for the transportation of non-public school students and policies for busing programs for the transportation of non-public school students. Uh, so again, our goal, our, our uh, requirement is as a, as a, meet, uh, as a group uh, to learn about student transportation hear about issues, uh, determine options for school systems, and create a final report that will be provided to the General Assembly. As Mr. Talor uh, spoke about a condensed timeline, uh, the reason we have our four meetings in the format that we do is we have a very short time to not only meet, uh, gather data, uh, compile the data, report it out, gather recommendations, and complete a report. Uh, the legislation uh, that was passed requires that on or before December 15th of 2023 this year, the task force shall report its findings and recommendations um, to the state uh, budget and taxation committee, the state committee on education, energy and the environment, the house appropriations committee and the house ways and means committee. Uh, in order to complete the report uh, to the general assembly by December 15th, I will be uh, in need of compiling the report sometime in October to ensure that it's reviewed. Uh, and approved before it gets sent off. So we'll be doing a lot of work here behind the scenes uh, during and after each of our meetings to get this timeline uh, accomplished. At this point, um, to provide some information on the background, um, I've asked Delegate Attar to give us an, uh, an overview of uh, House Bill 486, uh, the reason we've all been brought together. Uh, and uh, at this time, I'd like to give her the floor to discuss um, the historical view of this task force. Thank you, Gabriel. I want to first begin by thanking you very much for all the work you've done on this and the leadership you've taken. Um, I know this is our first meeting, but you and I have met, we've spoken multiple times, and I've seen all the work and effort you've put into this. So um, I appreciate you. And thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time to be in this meeting with us and to be on this task force to make this happen. So a little bit about the background. I represent District 41 in Baltimore City. Um, I'm actually a neighboring district to Senator Shelley Hedelman, where she has um, similar um, constituents. And many of our constituents are in uh, private schools for many different reasons. We have private schools throughout the state that people are in for many different reasons. But something that I've noticed and that many constituents have brought to my attention is primarily safety and environmental issues. Right now, the way it works is we have thousands of students going via carpools, going by regular car transportation to schools. Um, I can tell you in my district, many of them live in the same vicinity in the same couple block radius when they're going to the same schools and you have children running in front of cars. It, it's it's just extreme, uh, and it, it's a huge safety issue when you have so many children from a little area that need to get to these schools. And at the same time, I was on the Environment and Transportation Committee for two years. I'm a policymaker, and it's my goal to ensure we are focusing on our environment as well. And the more cars we're having on the roads, 
the less environmentally sound it is down the line. So busing, especially as we're moving towards possibly electric busing, which down the line would be great, but busing, things like that are a huge help in that way. So those are my two top priorities and the two main reasons why I put this bill in. Now, another aspect to it, which I've heard from a lot of my constituents is it's nearly impossible for a parent to be able to work a full day of school when their children don't have bus transportation to get to school. Um, and we don't, we, we don't want to um, prevent anyone from be able, being able to work and things like that. And it definitely is one of the um, problems many parents have. And again, parents send their children to private schools for many different reasons. And we want to ensure that their children are getting everything they possibly can, um, which in this case would be the private school transportation. So when I had filed this bill originally, it had been with, after a couple of years, lots of discussions with many different schools, many different parents. Um, originally, the way it was filed was that it will be a tax credit towards parents who use it. We ended up along with the comptroller's office, um, understanding that there may be difficulties with the way the bill was drafted. Um, so we were all in agreement that what we would do is we would change it to a task force that will have everyone at the table to come up with solutions, the best way to do this, the best way we can put in a bill this coming session and the reports due December 15th. My plan is to take um, the recommendations from that report the day after and have that drafted into a bill and have that bill filed immediately so we can move forward with this. And hopefully the goal would be by the following year that the schools can start implementing this um, bus transportation for their students. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. Again, my the main two concerns are safety safety and environmental aspects. And that is why we are here today. And I thank you all again. And I'm also open to any questions, whether it's now, after, in between. I've been working with a lot of people, many people on this call as well on this issue. We've done a lot of research um, and we've put a lot of time and effort into this and we, are, I'm, we will continue to do so to ensure that this task force gets the best, it comes up with the best possible outcome for everyone in the state of Maryland. So thank you all. All right. Thank you, Delegate Attar. Uh, any questions uh, following uh, Delegate Attar's presentation? All right. Thank you again. So as we move into um, kind of the work of the task force, uh, I think a good starting point will be to understand the current status of public school transportation in Maryland, since that is going to be one of the main focuses, I think, of discussion, uh, how public school systems and non-public school systems transportation might be able to uh, be an option or consideration. Uh, it's not the only one. Obviously, there are a variety of different things that uh, the task force can come up with. Um, but I think right now we want to talk about the current status of transportation in Maryland so we can get a good, solid beginning picture of where we are with our buses and how they're uh, utilized throughout the state. So uh, as we go through here, if there's any questions or any comments that you guys wish to uh, uh, ask, feel free to do so. Um, but this is going to be for uh, kind of the, the beginning of the discussion. So as we all might be aware of, uh, in Maryland, we have uh, 24 LEAs or local education agencies, uh, plus the Seed School of Baltimore. Uh, these are all school systems that have their either board or members of trustee that oversee policies and procedures for their public school system. Uh, the Maryland School for the Blind and the Maryland School for the Deaf do have transportation to and from provided by local education agencies. Um, they also, these uh, two schools may have transportation during the day that's run by each location. So just to give everyone an understanding, um, most students are bused to and from school uh, by their school system, and that is a privilege. It's obviously something that we want our students to get because it allows them an educational opportunity. It also provides them the ability to get uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, but when we talk about who's federally required, uh, our school systems are bound by federal law that they must transport students that have transportation identified as a related service on their IEPs. Uh, these would be your students that are either wheelchair bound, uh, have severe cognitive disabilities that would need to be uh, in a harness or restraint on a bus, students that have medical concerns that need uh, an aid. Uh, these are a protected class that must be provided transportation to accomplish the IEP goals. The other populations that are required by federal law to transport are students that are in foster care. Uh, they might be traveling out of county to a different school system than where they reside, uh, but they are required to be provided transportation by each local school system. 
And lastly, students that are experiencing homelessness or are families in transition. Uh, there is what's called a, a school of origin. Uh, the school systems uh, must be uh, in communication and collaborate with social services to ensure that these students are getting the education regardless of where they lay their heads at night. Uh, so these are your federally protected populations that transportation to and from school must be provided by our public school systems. So what we do here at the State Department of Education is every year we gather a report of the operations across the state. Um, this information is uh, gathered every June at the end of the school year. Uh, it's compiled into what we call our end of year report. Uh, and we only gather information from our public school systems, all 24 plus the seed school. Uh, our latest numbers were gathered in January of this year. Um, and I'll just dispense the information quickly for you guys. Uh, so at a glance in Maryland, uh, you may all know that we have a lot of school systems, but we also have a lot of public schools and it's specifically 1400 public schools in our 24 LEAs uh, serving all the counties plus Baltimore City. Um, since 2020, obviously with the pandemic, enrollment declined by 2%. Since 2022, back to when schools kind of reopened and went back to what we would consider normal operation, enrollment has then increased by 1%. Uh, since 2014, enrollment overall has increased by 3%. And in the school year of 2022-2023, we, uh, we had over 889,000 students enrolled in Maryland public schools from pre-K to high school. So we're approaching our 900,000 students enrolled. For the 2022 school year, uh, from the data that I was able to locate, there are around 834 private schools. Uh, these private schools serve approximately 139,000 students in Maryland, which means 14% of all students in Maryland are, ed are educated in private schools compared to the national average of 10%. So this is part of our end of year report, which shows how many students are transported by every LEA. And this information will be sent to all members to have as well following this meeting. Uh, it's also public facing on our website uh, for MSDE transportation. You'll find this uh, posted on our website that you can access at any time as well. But you will see our information is uh, broken up into two different uh, sections. What we consider non-disabled pupils transported. These would be what we would consider your regular or general ed students. And are disabled. These would be our students that are uh, that have transportation identified as a related service on their IEP. Uh, so as you can see, the numbers fluctuate based upon the county. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see the grand total of pupils transported. Uh, this is just half of the state at this time. And as we get down to the bottom of the second uh, data collection point, we have a total of the state of about 636,000 students that are transported to and from school um, every year. So if we use that number of 889,000 students enrolled in Maryland public schools, 636,000 approximately are eligible and or take public school transportation, which uh, equates to about 72% of our public school students are eligible and or take public school transportation every year. So of that 100%, what do the other 28% do that aren't riding our buses? Uh, for our high school students, they uh, might be juniors and seniors that may drive themselves to and from school. They might be transporting uh, friends, uh, siblings in their cars. Uh, for our urban areas, students might be walking or biking to school. They might be using a, a walking school bus, a collection of um, students that walk down a predetermined route, uh, and you know, uh, responsible adults will be able to take them the rest of the way. Or parents or custodians may drive them to and from school. And as Delegate Atar said, that is one of the issues that we've been dealing with most across the state following the pandemic and the return to school. We've reduced the number of students on buses and increased the number of students in cars due to um, what well, we'll talk about concerns with uh, public school transportation shortly. So in understanding our fleet in Maryland, uh, we have a variety of types of buses and you'll see up at the top, we have public owned and contracted owned vehicles. Uh, just to give you guys an understanding, public owned means that the Board of Ed for every school system owns and operates these vehicles. 
uh, counties such as Montgomery County, Frederick County, Baltimore County, Prince George's County, and Talbot County uh, consist of vehicles that are owned and operated by the public school system. Contracted vehicles, these would be vehicles that are owned and operated by uh, an outside party than the school system, uh, typically a small business. Uh, and these would be uh, vehicles that are run by uh, individual drivers that are employed by someone else other than the school system. Uh, in Maryland, we'll break down the numbers even farther, but we're about 50-50 when it comes to the numbers in the state. Uh, in terms of vehicles, uh, up at the top, you have letters such as A, B, C, and D. Uh, these represent the types of buses that are used in the state. A is a smaller bus, uh, what we call a mini bus. Uh, typically, daycare providers use these. Uh, type B buses are an old style, which has the engine halfway into the passenger compartment. It's typically not used as much anymore. C is your conventional bus with the engine in the front. It's what we see as a typical school bus in our minds. And D, we would call these our pusher buses or transit buses. These have the front uh, as flat and the engine mounted in the rear. Uh, Montgomery County uh, and Talbot County, I believe, are two of the ones that use these the most. But you can see by uh, the numbers, the number of route vehicles for every county varies uh, regarding uh, you know, the size of the public school system that they work in. Uh, so in the state, uh, we have approximately at this point around 7,000 buses that are used by all school systems to transport students. Uh, and the numbers, as you can see, are kind of half and half when it comes to the number of buses um, uh, for contracted versus public owned. So those 7,074 7, buses transport are 636,000 students every day. So with our public school systems, uh, as we're probably all aware, there are some issues that they're all dealing with when it comes to their own operations. Uh, the first thing that we've heard about consistently, um, and it's been going on uh, for decades, is a national and statewide driver shortage. Uh, when we say driver shortage, it's not just that they don't have enough to operate one day, it's that it's consistently they are not able to ensure that if a bus, is, uh, a bus driver is out sick, that they don't have a backup that can help out. Uh, they don't have the what we call the uh, growth or expansion assist uh, availability um, so that if there's uh, sick outs, uh, issues with hiring or uh, uh, a significant layoff or, or loss of drivers, we're not able to quickly recover and continue the operations as is. Uh, this was obviously exacerbated with the pandemic and it increased significantly, um, but we've always had somewhat of a driver shortage. And I think it's recently become more um, more in the public perception or more public aware uh, with obviously the start of the school year. Some other issues that our school systems are dealing with, uh, school bus manufacturing delays. Again, with the pandemic onset, uh, facilities and fa um, factories shut down, uh, which caused a delay in uh, school bus manufacturing. When they came back online, they have not been able to catch up to pre-pandemic manufacturing timelines. So now school systems are receiving buses throughout the school year versus all at the summertime before school starts. Uh, so at this point, if school systems purchase a bus, it might be a year to 18 months until that bus actually arrives. And lastly, what a lot of school systems have seen um, is a cost of equipment and repairs have gone up as well uh, with uh, the consumer price index rising, as well as a lot of other costs uh, with equipment increasing. Uh, any downtime of buses is going to be costly uh, and repairs are going to be uh, delayed uh, or out of the price range of some of our small businesses, um, depending on the type of damage or failure of the equipment. So we talked about public school systems a little bit. Um, to talk now about our non-public school systems, to get an understanding of what our non-public school systems transportation requirements are. Under the U.S. Department of Education, Transportation for Private Schools, they have identified only two requirements. One, that school buses used to transport students to non-public schools must be equipped with seatback crash pads that meet the standards established by the Maryland Motor Vehicle Administration. And secondly, school buses owned by private schools that are exempt from federal income tax under 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code are not subject to exercise tax upon issuance of a certificate of title. The only other requirement is under COMAR 1119 of the MVA. Uh, and this sets the standard for all school vehicle driver requirements. Uh, CDLs 
uh, drug and alcohol testing, et cetera. The school vehicle construction, that it has to be built to the same specifications as our public school buses. It has to look like a bus. It has to be painted and identified. And lastly, school vehicle inspections. Any school bus that is transporting non-public school students must still be inspected uh, and be in line with the MVA's requirements. So as we move into uh, our next phase of um, discussion, I want to give a brief understanding of is non-public school transportation being provided already by some of our school systems? And understanding uh, our LEAs, there are actually some school systems that have policies or procedures set up for the transportation of non-public school students. So one, in Howard County, their policy 5200, student transportation. Uh, students who attend parochial schools will receive transportation services as provided in the Howard County Code and the Howard County Public School System policies and procedures. The service will be provided only on a space available basis along existing school bus routes designed to serve public schools. Parochial schools that receive state aid will not receive transportation services. Um, I have not reached out to Howard County and uh, determined if there's any numbers that are being transported currently, but this is in their policies. Calvert County, uh, under Maryland law, uh, Education Article 7-801, requires that the Calvert County Board of Education shall offer uh, to students attending a non-public school transportation if there is sufficient capacity on the school bus, if the student also resides along or near uh, a public highway in the county of which a public school bus or convenience operates, if the student resides in the public school transportation district served by the public school bus, and only on the route school days and hours of transportation that coincide with the route school days and hours of transportation for students attending public schools in the county. And in the case of a student who attends a non-public school that is not on the public school bus route, only to the public school on the route, which is nearest to the non-public school. As a uh, attachment to this, the Calvert County Board is not responsible for the safety of any non-public school student who is transported on a public school bus under the subsection after the student is discharged from the public school bus and the board may not be held liable in any civil action arising from an act or omission that occurs after the student is discharged from the public school bus, a layer of uh, liability coverage. And our last county, St. Mary's County, uh, this is a, uh, a kind of strange accommodation that they've set up, uh, but back in 1941, uh, St. Mary's uh, adopted a county code uh, that required that transportation be provided to non-public school students who live on or along a public road in St. Mary's County on which public school bus service is being provided and they shall be entitled to non-public school transportation. In short, school transport vehicles shall operate only on public roadways as listed for maintenance on the latest official state, county, or town highway maps. Exemptions for service onto private roads will be based on special circumstances and will only be on roads that are properly maintained. All exemptions must be approved by the Board of Education. So if there is a student whose family resides in St. Mary's County, there's no charge for using the non-public school transportation system. However, there is a $900 per student year charge for all out-of-county residents based on the fee schedule determined for the current school year. For shorter durations of time, the fee may be prorated. For extenuating circumstances and hardships, the fee may be waived in whole or in part based upon review as a written request. So what St. Mary's County does is they pay about 2.2 million for bus contract services for the private schools, six of which are Catholic schools. And they provide transportation for approximately 1,400 students uh, to and from their private school. And I believe that is still going on to this day, um, but that is something that the county pays for out of their own funds. It's not state funds and it's not the local school system. It's a countywide uh, uh, contract with the public school system for the transportation of those students. So um, before we get into our first uh, discussion question, I'm just going to give an overview of our state funding for student transportation. Um, I also have Mr. Justin Dayhoff, our, um, our most knowledgeable individual when it comes to our state funding programs. So I will just give a brief overview. And if uh, Justin would like to chime in at any point, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, our state has two different forms of funding for our public school students uh, for transportation. Uh, the first is that under Maryland Educational Article 8-410, um, 
It identifies students that are required to be transported. Uh, as we talked about earlier, our non-public school, our, I'm sorry, our students with disabilities, homeless in foster care. Uh, every school system receives funding annually uh, that is specifically designed to assist in the transportation of students uh, to and from school. Uh, this would be your general fund. It's increased uh, every year based upon uh, certain factors uh, that I can't relate off the top of my head right now, but Justin might be able to let me know uh, if he can think of anything about uh, what's used to increase it. I think it might be consumer price index uh, or something else along that line. Um, but it's increased every year uh, and any funds not used can be rolled over to the following year. Uh, funds provided to school systems for transportation can't be used in any other category um, or for any other purpose in the school system. So that's some funding for our transportation in our public schools, and that's typically what we call our general funding. Uh, the other funding that's provided is specifically for students with a disability. Uh, every year on the last Friday of October, our school systems take a um, account of all those students that are transported with um, an IEP, uh, and if they are eligible for services, are receiving services, and are transported on the last Friday of October, each school system gets $1,000 per student to offset on the additional cost that it takes to provide a lift bus, multiple attendance on the bus, or anything else equipment-wise. Uh, but those are our two sources of funding that we provide to school systems for student transportation. Uh, as I said, $1,000 for every um, student with a disability that has transportation as a related service, and that started back in 2008 and has remained so uh, consistently since then. So just a brief overview of the funding that we provide. Um, as you can see, the first column is the number of students transported that have a disability. Um, so you multiply that by $1,000, and that's the second column that they receive. As you can see, the third and fourth column are the two different fiscal years, uh, fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022. Uh, these would be the general uh, transportation funding. And the last column is the combination of the regular grant funding and the disabled grant funding. And that equates to a portion of the school's transportation amounts. This is not all the funding that the school systems get for transportation. Local, um, local counties also provide funding. Um, but the state is providing some to offset the cost of the operations. Uh, so looking at all the information, uh, you can see that the total state funding that's provided to our school systems for transportation, combining our regular grant and our disabled grant is approximately $288 million. So I feel like I've spoken for quite a bit of time and we've set the the understanding of transportation in Maryland at a very high level, um, you know, 22,000 feet. Uh, so at this point, um, as chair, I want to see from the group if there's uh, any any options that you all have seen uh, from either being a part of non-public schools um, administrator or transportation. Uh, what options are available for our non-public schools to provide transportation for students to and from school? And at this point, I'd like to hear from any members that would like to speak out about what they see as options for our school, our non-public school um, locations. So Mr. Clark, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh... At MTA, um, I think Ariel Sadwin spoke earlier about um, working with us on a few parochial schools in Baltimore, in Baltimore County, um, mainly. Um, so, you know, we do provide some service. I mean, we provide a lot of school service for public schools. Um, we provide very little service for the parochial schools. I think, um, you know, we can uh, add to that service. I mean, we do have the... Um, the uh i guess the 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 resources to do so the, because the way we do like school trips we don't separate them out of regular bus trips like we used to we just kind of interline like a, a trip will come out of the bus division um do a trip uh to a school and then that trip interlines into like a regular route that's close to that school or close to where it's going to and from so um i think we do have some space to do that in baltimore 
um, in Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County, where we generally serve here at MTA, you know, our service, our service area. Um, I, I think what I would need, though, is like a list of schools. Um, I'm, I'm curious to like the eligibility. We did go over like eligibility um, for kids that take the school, but I'm curious to know like uh, what would that eligibility look like and what would those numbers look like? Because I'm not super familiar with a lot of the private and parochial schools in our service area like I am with like public schools because we serve those on a regular basis. Gotcha. So, uh, Mr. Clark, is there any other locations? You said Baltimore and Anne Arundel County. Those are the two that MTA will typically operate in. Yeah, those are the two counties that we typically operate in: Baltimore County and uh, and in Anne Arundel County. We do have a little bit of service, like out in Howard County. Um, other than that, like we we do hit the state with uh, like commuter services, but those aren't like regular transit buses. Those are more like coach buses dedicated to getting people to their nine to fives um, around the state and in Washington D.C. But as far as our local service, yes, yeah, mainly Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Clark. You're welcome, Mr. Sidewalk. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, since uh, Mr. Clark mentioned uh, in my my earlier reference, I'll just you know speak for a second about that. So, um, so th there are there are four, four school campuses in the Jewish community up here in between 11 and 41, where uh, there is a route that goes all through. A, it's it's a very long route that goes throughout um, what we call the, the 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 Orthodox Jewish community. Uh, it's it starts uh, on Glen Avenue. Uh, and about an hour later, it picks up, or like 50 minutes later, it picks up the last student on the run, and then it goes to one of four different campuses. Um, it's been going on for a while, and it, it has been utilized to this very day. And then I can talk at great length about it and about different things we've added, implemented, changed, modified, uh, and all the folks that I, all the good folks at MTA that I've worked with. Uh, we did a survey, um, you know, because the number of 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 students and households utilizing the community was dramatically lower than the size of the community. And like earlier, uh, uh, Gabriel, you mentioned you know the the statistics of what percentage of the public school students uh, that that use the bus. So in our surveys, that we had like nearly eighty percent of who want bus transportation, and basically about fifteen percent were utilizing the MTA, even though it goes to their schools. Um, the reason for that is this is there are safety concerns because it is a public bus that anybody can get on at any at any time. Anybody who has who has a bus ticket can get onto the bus. There have been incidents over the years, nothing, thank God, that has been of great concern, but concerns nonetheless. Parents have complained. Uh, we've had to deal with uh, MTA police on a number of occasions. Um, there was there was a fellow that would get on the same spot uh, basically every day, and and all of a sudden that that run to that school. Basically, no one went on there anymore because because again they can't tell him that he can't go on there. Uh, but you know some of his behavior was erratic enough that you know had complaints. So just to make a, a long, very long story very short, uh, you know that the, the the desire for a traditional school busing option has you know across the uh, the about eight thousand student uh, of the of the just just the Baltimore city county. Jewish day school community uh, is about 80% uh, who said, you know, tomorrow we'll put our kids on there. You know, once, you know, once if something like this can be put together in, in comparison to the about 15% or so uh, who are participating with the MTA. So, so, you know, increasing and modifying aspects of the current MTA offering, I'm sure would boost the numbers to an extent, uh, but ultimately a, a model that is available in other states uh, and or perhaps in you know St. Mary's was the one that was most comparable, I guess St. Mary's County that would be available would be would be very much uh, the the goal here from you know from the non-public school conversation as we see it uh, and myself in the Jewish community as well as across Maryland Cape the the non-public school community that we're interacting with on a regular basis. Uh, there was there wasn't there was an item which I, and we could probably I don't know if the structure will allow. For the input from from uh, from other, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, former officials, but uh, there was a fellow 
who a number of years ago in Montgomery County, he was formerly the head of, of, uh, of, of school busing in Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, he, he was part of, of, of a group that was involved with some non-public schools and some other advocates to create a program in Montgomery County. It was only a pilot program and it was it was allowed and facilitated by Montgomery County Council for basically it was a few months and then and then the funding was not continued. But that fellow, uh, and I can provide his information, uh, he's retired now, but I'm sure he'd be available. I mean, we could reach out to see if he would be available uh, to address uh, you know, what they did there, uh, you know, from his expertise, he was hired as a consultant since he was already out of his position in Montgomery County uh, and and had a successful implementation from a programming side. The funding was where things uh, didn't continue, but um, but just from 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 the implementation side of it uh, would probably be valuable input. Sure, and thank you. And um, at the conclusion of the meeting, I think we have some uh, next steps and one of that would be uh, outside presenters. Uh, so I think that information would be great to have at that time. And I, if you're able to send me any information on uh, an outside party you'd like to have present, feel free to send it my way. Uh, and we can uh, include that in the next meeting, provide them an opportunity to talk more about, like you said, the pilot program, the funding source, so we have a, a better understanding of how that went um, with MCPS. Uh, so thank you. And uh, Mr. O'Day. Thank you, Gabriel, appreciate it. Um, so uh, I was involved as well with the uh, non-public uh, pilot program in Montgomery County uh, with Rabbi Sadwin. I believe the gentleman he's talking about, um, I think his uh, daughter is still a principal at one of our Catholic schools. So if we can't track him down, I could always reach out to her. So I just wanted to add that too as well. But yeah, it is my understanding that we are have still having busing through St. Mary's County. We have six schools down there, as you mentioned, uh, four archdioceses and two independents. And then... Um, the Howard County, as you mentioned, the funding was pulled by the county, but they do have a model there that ran for, I think, 20 or 30 years with uh, parochial school students being bused in uh, through the Howard County system. I believe it was just a matter of kind of like what I grew up with in New York, which is everybody gets on the same bus on the public school bus lines together. They go out you know, to their houses directly, I believe, or a drop off uh, location, and then they're uh, bused to the school. Uh, the one other thing I would look into, I can look into it as well, too, is but I believe that Talbot, Talbot County had some sort of program at some point. I'm not sure if you mentioned that or not. Um, I'm trying to remember if it's just in the county code or there was actually schools out there participating, but I'll dig into that in the meantime. Thank you, Mr. O'Day. Um, I think, did you say it was Calvert or Talbot? Sorry, Talbot with a T. Okay. All right. So it sounds like we have obviously our MVA, or I'm sorry, our um, MTA representative that uh, spoke about existing public uh, existing public transportation that non-public schools can utilize, but we understand the issues of uh, safety, consistency, and limitations, obviously, on where that's implemented across the state. Uh, we've heard uh, that there are some pilot programs that were done in, in Montgomery County we might look into. Um, something with public school buses being utilized, I heard that that was one of using uh, buses from a public school system on an already existing route. Um, but are any public school, are any, are any non-public or private schools uh, using transportation that they fund um, directly? Are any of our non-public schools buying buses and operating them independently of public school systems? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, that is something that... Uh, Many many schools, um, the the independent schools for sure have 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 many of those. Uh, but you know, but many many private schools do own you know one two or even many buses, and they have a program in place which they either add to the tuition, um, you know, in in a variety of different manners. Okay, uh, so thank you. We'll go with uh, Ariel. Um, okay, thank you. I, I think that's a, can you hear me? Was I? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I think that's a really good question to flag as we think about different policy options here that um, the gold standard in, I think amongst many of in our thinking would be yes, the um, school district, public school system, partnering with the state to provide, to provide busing, 
that's the that's the gold standard here. Um, finding out from schools if there were to be greater demand, um, would they be able to hack it? Would they be able to take on that burden and set up a system? Um, so right, so some of the policy proposals we could um, advance might be subsidies for families. So subsidies for families would mean more demand, uh, but can these schools ha handle that lift um, and set up these systems? So I think that's just a question for us to flag. Um, All right, uh, Delegate Thorne. Thank you. Um, so I want to just point out that yes, we have had schools, some in my district, that have tried and are still trying um, to put some together. I just want to point out that many of these schools have many low income students. Um, they receive a lot of the boost funding. And the reason why something like this cannot work, that it's just privately funded, is because many parents can't afford it. And they're already struggling with sending the kids to the schools they are in. So requiring, continuing it the way it is, it, there's such low, it's not a low demand, but it's such low usage because of the, the amount it's putting on the parents. So I just wanna point that out. We are, I've heard from parents primarily from schools that have a large portion of low income students. This isn't, um, I'm not hearing from parents from schools um, that most of the student that it's very high tuition and many any students are not low income. Understood. Um, so a question that comes up with our public school systems is uh, something about bell times. Um, the way our school systems work is they have to work within a defined time of getting their students to and from school. And I think one option that I've heard uh, from others is um, utilizing school buses during off hours, uh, times when uh, they're not transporting their public school students. So could you provide an understanding of how non-public schools schedule their day? Um, what hours do they work around? Is there someone that determines um, a standard uh, hours of a school system? And Delegate Attar. So I can't necessarily answer that, but I can tell you that everyone I've spoken with, all the schools I've spoken with, and there have been many, are willing to adjust the day in order to make this happen if needed. So not necessarily by a crazy amount of hours, but this is a priority for many. So we're willing to make it work around it to make it happen. Now I'll let someone, if there's anyone from the school system that can answer that uh, more closely, but that's what I can just tell you from those that I've spoken with. Okay, uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you again. Um, I, I don't work for Baltimore County, but I am a parent of uh, children who attend Baltimore County schools, and they they do exactly that. Like their uh, their high schools um, bell times are are earliest, and then the middle school bell times, and then the elementary school bell times. And those same buses, you know, they pick up the high school kids. Uh, they take them home and then they go and serve the middle school and then they go and serve the elementary school. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, it works in Baltimore County for the most part. Um, I haven't had a problem with it or seen a problem with it. And, and the great thing about it, uh, which I learned is, you know, it gives the older kids the opportunity to get home and, you know, receive the younger kids if, you know, there isn't a parent home yet. So I, I thought that was an awesome thing for me as a parent, you know, knowing that my older child, even though my kids are pretty close in age, knowing that my oldest kid can be home first and, you know, be ready for my youngest, my younger child to get home. So I just wanted to make that that comment. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other members that haven't spoken, any, um, any understanding of what some options are that non-public schools have utilized in the past or um, the way that they deal with their students being transported to and from school? I know the primary way, obviously, uh, as we've said, is parents are having to transport the students to and from school, uh, which increases the drop off and pickup times for a lot of our schools, which adds more traffic and backups um, and also adds more pollution, as we've heard as, as well. Um, but is there anything else other than the MTA uh, or these small county operations that have been done uh, in, in Maryland? Uh, excuse me, Gabe. I'm on my phone, so I don't have a little hand to put up. No, go uh, ahead, Steve. Yep. Yeah. Um, I know in Hartford County and Cecil County, it would be almost impossible 
to use the regular ed buses. Um, we're packed pretty much to the gills on the buses as it is. And we do have staggered bell times. Um, the high school goes in between 7 and 7.15. Middle school is in uh, 7.45 to 8. And the first tier of elementary goes in at 8.35. And second tier elementary goes in at 9. So in Hartford County, our buses are pretty much tied up. Um, I mean, they're back in from 9.30 to 1.00. So that would be a time that they would have to run a, a private school run. And I just, and then it'd be five o'clock before we could take anything. I just don't see how that would work in Hartford County and probably Cecil County. All right. Thank you, Steve, for the, the information. I understand. Uh, Mr. Joseph. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say that uh, in our experience, we work with another uh, Catholic high school in the area and we uh, contract with an outside transportation service that provides transportation along three bus routes uh, for uh, both the students of that high school and our high school. And it's um, it's an addition to their tuition. I understand. So it's contracted services with an outside yes. vendor, you're saying? Okay. Yes. All right. Our tuition. All right, uh, Mr. West. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to to add on to the gentleman from, uh, I believe it was Harford County, um, and to uh, Mr. Clark. So with Baltimore County Public Schools, we do have a tiering system. So the high schools are going first, middle, and then there are two tiers of elementary. Our policy does allow us to transport to certain schools as long as the student is along the route and the bus um, can uh, logistically travel to that, that additional school. Um, with that being said, we would have the same challenge that the, I believe the gentleman from Harford County um, identified where we would have to almost add in another layer of schools. So that will be um, just a, uh, an item to think about um, because right now we have the, again, the, the full four tier system for all of our routes. All right. Thank you, Kenny. All right. So I've heard uh, contracting services with a outside bus vendor uh, that wouldn't be doing public school transportation during the day uh, since those hours don't line up. Um, Mr. West talked about adding a layer, uh, additional layer of school hours that would allow, if possible, uh, public school transportation to be provided. And we talked about uh, the other forms of transportation. So it sounds like there are some options. Um, some come with parameters or limitations, uh, but it's good to kind of hear about all the things that are either currently used or as, or, or as options right now. Uh, Mr. Saldwin. Mr. Sadwin. Yeah, the mic, that whole mic thing. I wish the state would start using Zoom. Anyway, um, I just combined a couple of the things that were mentioned. So in the, the Montgomery County pilot, uh, what, what ended up working out is, uh, aside from the fact that the council did not continue the funding, was the fact that they have, they, they had a, a surplus, at least then, of buses that they were able to accommodate, you know, with the staggered bell times because, you know, the schools started earlier and then later, you know, the time of the, the, the non-public schools that participated in the pilot. Um, and as a result, that's what they were able to accommodate. And we had, when I, I was part of a conversation a couple of years later, or not even a couple, like around the same time a year or so later with Baltimore County to do something similar, they said that we, we Baltimore County, don't nearly have the same number of buses available for our public schools as Montgomery County does. And as a result, you know, we find ourselves, especially for after school sports, that we're contracting with third party uh, bus companies in order to to and just to deal with what we have to deal with on our own. So that's why it was something which was not you know possible for them even to consider. So I don't know if, if that is still a problem today. This was a conversation a number of years ago, but you know, some jurisdictions have the ability to to you know maintain larger bus fleets. Uh, which is, you know, a important piece in that 
that angle of facilitating some kind of an arrangement. Okay. Thank you. And is there any other member that would like to add in to what we've already discussed or, or anything that we've missed? And we'll be revisiting this question probably a few times, but I think it's good to kind of understand where we stand right now with our understanding of options for our non-public schools in Maryland. Um, you know, I'm knowledgeable about our public school transportation program, um, but again, uh, I don't have any idea of what our non-public school systems are doing, so it's great to learn from you all on um, on how you're meeting the, the, the transportation of your students today and uh, for this year. Uh, any other questions or comments before we continue? I think this is a good starting point as we kind of learn and get started. All right. So uh, as we move on, we will have another uh, guide, uh, guiding question uh, at the end that we'll then use to kind of hear from all members before we wrap up. But what I want to provide to you right now as we move into our next part is understanding what our other state partners are doing. Um, we are not the first state that posed this question. Uh, and there are some states that are doing some program consistently. Uh, and there are some that have tried um, and not funded uh, different programs uh, for the past few years. Uh, so in preparation for this, uh, I did send out a survey to all 50 state directors of pupil transportation. Uh, out of those 50 states, we received 28 responses. And of those 28, 10 states did report having something in their laws or regulations that relate to the transportation of private or non-public school students out, other than those that are transported to um, non-public school placement for their IEPs. So I just wanted to give the group a quick understanding of what our other states are doing and how those programs might work for their state. Uh, it might give us a starting point to understand if needed what a program may look like in Maryland if we uh, go down that route. So in alphabetical order, this is what we were able to find. Um, first off in Alaska, Alaska law does govern uh, pupil transportation. Uh, the statutes include a provision regarding the transportation of non-public school students with program costs be paid by legislative appropriations. Uh, but in, for Alaska, uh, no appropriations have been received for the last 30 years, so it is an unfunded uh, requirement. Uh, in Delaware, uh, the General Assembly has not provided non-public funding since fiscal year 17. The state did provide the transportation funds to the non-public nonprofit school uh, for the families to use. The family then directed the non-public nonprofit school on how the funds would be dispersed. Um, and these funds would be used for school transportation costs, allowances, et cetera. Um, this hasn't been done for the past seven or eight years. So the director out there didn't really have any information other than that. Uh, Illinois, uh, one of our uh, states that have a lot of uh, non-public schools as well. Uh, these school districts that provide school bus transportation for public school students shall provide transportation without cost for children who attend any school other than a public school if they reside on at least one and one half miles from the school they attended. The children must reside along the route consisting the regular school bus route and extend from some point on the regular route nearest or most easily accessible to their homes to and from the school attended to or from a point on a regular route that is the nearest or most easily accessible to the school attended by such children. Um, it's quite a run-on sentence there, unfortunately, uh, but I think this is in line with some of our local counties' understanding of providing transportation if they live along an existing route. Indiana uh, does have a requirement uh, that transportation for rural charter or non-public school students, uh, a student is provided transportation if a non-public school is located in a school corporation, a charter school located in a rural school corporation resides on or along the highway consulting the regular route of a public bus. The governing body of that school corporation shall provide transportation for the non-public or charter school bus. And lastly, the transportation provided under the section must be from the home of the non-public or charter school student or from the point on the regular route nearest or most easily accessible to the home of the non-public or charter school student to and from the non-public or charter school student, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Iowa does have a code. Uh, I'm sorry, Iowa does have a program mandated by their uh, their code, which states that resident pupils attending a non-public school located either within or without the school district of the pupil's residence shall be entitled to transportation 
on the same basis as provided for resident public school pupils under this section. There is an appropriated from the general fund of the state to the Department of Education fund sufficient to pay for the approved claims of public school transportation for transportation services to non-public school students. Uh, so in Iowa, the program uh, is paid to the Department of Education for that state, and then the Department of Education holds the funds and then reimburses um, to those that are using those services to transport their students to non-public schools. Kansas has a, another law which requires, and I won't read the whole thing, uh, but it's very similar to some of the other ones that we saw. If transportation is provided to public school students, any non-public school students that are living, residing on the same route would be provided transportation to their non-public school as long as the school is within or on a route that's already existing for the public school system. Uh, Michigan, uh, this is another uh, one that would meet, I think the same one that we've seen consistently. Uh, here, transportation will be provided to non-public school students if the school district provides transportation to the elementary school level, middle or junior high school uh, in which the student is enrolled and the pupil attends either the public or near state approved non-public school in the school district to which the pupil is eligible to be admitted. And moving along with Nebraska, uh, School board of any public school district that provides transportation for students uh, attending the public school shall also provide transportation without cost for children residing in the district that attends a nonprofit, non non-public school within the same district. Uh, transportation provided for the nonprofit, non-public school only extends from the same point on the regular public school route nearest or most easily accessible to their home to and from a point on the public school route. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, this is one that was um, a little bit different. Uh, here they identify remote students, uh, which is defined as more than two miles between home and school for kindergarten through eighth, and more than two and a half miles for high school students. If a district is required to transport public school students, then it's also required to provide transportation services to non-public school students who reside in the district and live remote, but within tw two, uh, 20 miles of the nearest non-public school of attendance. The school district may not spend more than a certain amount per pupil to provide the non-public transportation, for the current year, the amount was $1,022. If the district is unable to provide a seat on the bus for non-public school students within that limit, then the district pays for the pays the parent the maximum dollar amount. And getting close to the end, for Wisconsin, uh, this is another one that would uh, deal specifically with the uh, transportation of a student located within two miles or more of the uh, pupil's residence. If such private school is a school within attendance area the pupil resides in and is situated within the school district, or not more than five miles beyond the boundaries of the school district measured along the usual traveled route. And I thought we had one more for Washington. Oh, we did Washington. Um, but that is the current status of what other states are doing. Ten that responded back. Uh, they have similar uh, laws or regulations that require that if transportation is provided for public school students, if there's um, uh, location or there's availability on the bus, uh, that transportation will be provided. Some states have um, uh, funding that would be provided uh, that would cover the cost of transportation that would be paid to the, the parent if transportation was set up. Uh, and I think we talked about the first two that were not funded, one for 30 years from Alaska and one for uh, Delaware, I think the past uh, seven or eight years. Um, so these are what we were able to find on what our other states are using as programs. And I can obviously get more information from my partners in those states if we want to look at uh, specific programs, gather data on uh, how they were set up, utilized, and what their um, you know, numbers are for use uh, or enrollment. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Frankston Morris. Yes, um, I'm curious to know if Pennsylvania and New York, if those states um, did not respond because I'm under the impression that they do have this type of program and these type of mandates. Um, Pennsylvania and New York were not responding to the survey. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Yes, we're in my in my national group. We work very closely with um, departments in those states, and they have the same type of mandates um, as pretty much the rest of those that busing has to be offered on the same terms to public, um, to non-public school students. So, okay, that makes a lot of sense that they didn't respond, so they're not on the list. 
Thank well, you. And with that information, I will bother them a little bit more. Okay. I know them. So just to make sure that they do complete the survey and I can get okay. some more information that I can uh, provide to the task force. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Saldwin. Saldwin. Yes, and I see that the delegate is also raising your hand. I mean, we we've, we have we have seen a lot of of material that's been compiled by by different people, state to state. I have I have a, a very extensive spreadsheet that somebody, a volunteer in our community, put together, that has a lot of this information of the states that did not respond. Um, so, but at whatever point that will be helpful to to the conversation, you know, I'm happy to provide that, or the delegate has it as well. Okay. And uh, did you say uh, one of the delegates had their hand raised? I don't see anything on my screen. It was me for a second, but then I saw, I figured he would say what I was going to say. Yes, we can send those lists over. I know Connecticut also has a similar program. So we do have a lot of states surrounding Maryland um, that have these programs that are um, publicly funded. All right. Uh, and Connecticut is another one that did not respond. So thank you for the information. All right. So Regarding the collection of information, uh, one requirement of the um, task force as we move into uh, the conclusion of this meeting is that we are going to be gathering information from our non-public schools um, about what programs they might be using for transportation uh, to get an, a picture of what's currently being utilized across the state. Uh, so the task force, our goal is to collect information from each local board of education and any other relevant county department regarding the non-public school students busing programs in the county, other than programs for the transportation of students in special education placements. So to accomplish that, uh, prior to this meeting, uh, we've worked hard with our staff at MSDE to create a survey for non-public schools and public schools. Uh, this is just a um, snapshot of a letter that went out to all of our non-public schools uh, asking for their information and feedback uh, regarding um, what transportation programs they may or may not use. Uh, if there's multiple campuses, they only have to complete it once. Um, I'm sorry, it has to be completed for every school. Uh, it's sent electronically, and we have a completion date of September 15th in order to get that information back to us. Uh, and Mr. O'Day, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thanks very much, Gabriel. Uh, that'd be great. Um, that sounds awesome. Um, my question was, can you or would you be willing to you know, share the link with us? And if it's helpful, we have a huge database through CAPE, Rabbi Sabin and I do for a lot of the non-public schools. I also have a separate database of the Catholic schools, 150 statewide. So and we can press them on making sure that we get a robust response on that survey if you want us to also put it out. Understand. Uh, we have a list of schools that um, they have to complete every year a enrollment number. Uh, so we have a list of locations that uh, my office was not identifying all these schools. We have a list uh, from an, a separate office, uh, but they sent it out. But I'm I will check and make sure that if we're able to send it to you, we can. Uh, I'll let you know what the uh, the questions are that we're asking uh, shortly. So you have that. But I'll be gladly send it out to the members as well. So thank you. Uh, and delegate Carr. Thanks. Did you say you sent this out already? Yes, the non-public school survey went out already. Um, right. We're going to be sending it, one out. When did it go out? Do you know? It would have been, I believe. It's fine. You can let me know later. I just. It would have been gone out, I believe, this week. If not early this okay. week, it would have been late last week. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let me move this. Okay, so uh, to keep everyone informed, uh, the questions that were on the survey uh, were vetted uh, through our office, uh, through through uh, our offices and the superintendent's approval as well. Uh, but this is the basic survey that went out to our non-public school partners. Uh, it asked for their email address, uh, their first and last name, whoever's responding on behalf of the school system, and their title. Uh, we know that not all public school systems have uh, email accounts, uh, so these were also mailed out as well. So once they receive it, they can give us a call and they can provide us the information over the phone or they can uh, mail it back to us. So just because they don't have an email address doesn't mean that they can't respond. Um, so we get the basic information. Uh, we get their school identification number uh, that was provided in the mail. Uh, so MSDE does have a school identification number for the private schools uh, that would be receiving this. So it's just to make sure that we can track and make sure the numbers are correct and haven't changed. And lastly, the school name, uh, if it appears 
on the email or the mail, it lets them know that, you know, if it's the Goddard School uh, or if it's a French International School, that if the name has changed, they can respond back and let us know as well. So we provide a quick survey, uh, which basically asks the following questions. Uh, we ask them to respond to the best of their ability. Uh, if it doesn't apply to them, to put NA. Um, we are asking for if there's a student busing program at their school. Uh, if it's operational, meaning it's currently uh, going, or if it will be operational this year. If it's out of service, uh, meaning it's not funded or it hasn't been funded for a period of time. This might be the pilot program that we talked about for Montgomery County. If it does not apply, meaning they never had it or they have no intention on having one. And lastly, other, uh, they can fill in whatever they feel wasn't uh, an option up top. Uh, and just to preface this again, uh, there was a list of uh, instructions that was also sent to this. So the term operational and the term out of service were uh, defined for them in the instructions. And uh, for the busing programs that the school uses, if they selected operational or out of service, uh, we asked them to provide the name of the program uh, so that we can start gathering that information as well. We asked them for not only the name of the program, uh, but we ask uh, if they have administra administrative offices. Uh, we ask for the physical address so we can start finding information about where they're all located across the state, uh, what programs are being used or what companies are being utilized so we can start getting an idea of the status across the state of our non-public school transportation. And along with this, just to update our own information, uh, we ask for the end of year enrollment for the school, as well as the number of students using the, the student busing program described earlier. Uh, so here we're asking for what was the school enrollment at the end of the year for the 2022-2023 school year. We asked that out of the total uh, end of year enrollment, how many students were enrolled in special education placements from the non-public school? And lastly, how many of the enrolled students used the student busing program uh, and we wanted to specify that we did not want in this number the number of students in special education placements. Uh, so we're trying to gather all the information about the programs in the state, uh, who's utilizing what, and to figure out the proportion or percentage of our non-public school students that are using these forms of transportation. So that brings us to our... Um, our next steps for our survey results. As I discussed, these surveys will be uh, hopefully completed and submitted by September 15th to the MSDE. Our next meeting date is the 14th. Um, I'm sorry, is the 16th, but we will, let me, let me go back. The non-public school surveys will be completed and submitted by September 15th to the MSDE. Public school surveys will also be due September 15th. Um, even though our meeting is the 14th, the day prior, we should have initial data back well ahead of that that we'll be able to present to the group at that time. And if there's any data that was not received by our next meeting, it will be provided in a final format for the September 28th meeting. So that brings us to the last uh, guiding discussion that I wanted to have with the group. And I think we talked about this a little bit already. Um, hearing with what other states were using um, to assist with their non-public school transportation, uh, i.e. transporting students along existing routes, uh, if it's going near or within a school district's bound or a school system boundary uh, for non-public school. But as Mr. West uh, and uh, Steve discussed um, the limitations with our public school systems, uh, for our members here, and this is again time for anyone to, to chime in, uh, understanding what we know now of our public school transportation programs uh, will our public school systems be able to accommodate non-public school students within their operation as it currently stands? And if not, what accommodations would we have to make to meet the requirements or to meet the uh, transportation of our additional, um, you know, uh, non-public school students, which I think was at around 100,000 100, or so, 80% uh, of that 100,000 that might be utilizing uh, transportation. So. I think we have Mr. West and Steve. Um, I'm not sure if we have any other members from our public school systems, um, but would you guys be able to provide any other information about uh, the systems transporting private school students on buses within your operation? 
Good afternoon. Um, so Baltimore County's enrollment um, is right around 112,000 and we transport just nearly 80,000. Um, currently our policy 3410 does state that students who attend private elementary or secondary schools in Baltimore County may be transported um, in accordance with Baltimore County code. So essentially um, they're transported on a BCPS bus provided there is space available um, and that it is along an established BCPS school bus route. So those are kind of the limitations. So in other words, um, the, the bus has to be, has to have capacity to be able to absorb the students. And it has to be along the existing route that we've written um, to service whatever BCPS school that bus will be servicing. Um, so we'd have to look at it on a case by case basis, but um, broad strokes, it would it would essentially be adding another school to the mix um, and additional students to the mix, and of course that would be would present other challenges. We are we have been purchasing larger buses to transport our own students when when we're able to do so. So I think for the majority, we'd have to look at that on a case by case basis, but overall that would it will present additional challenges. And I think uh, um, Mr. Sadwin may have asked the question um, earlier when he was speaking about um, Montgomery County's um, pilot program. We did speak with, and I don't recall if it was Mr. Sadwin um, exactly, but we did speak with um, various parochial school leaders about the potential of doing a pilot in Montgomery County and uh, Baltimore County. And um, we do employ six contractors. So we we are supplemented about 20% of our operation is our contractors. So Baltimore County, we own um, 850 buses or so. We still have 20% of our routes that are contracted out. Um, so that we, we already have a capacity um, balance that we that we strike between our buses and contracted buses. All right. Thank you, Mr. West. Uh, Mr. Uh, Quarterman. Thank you. I actually had a follow-up question there from Mr. West. It sounded like in Baltimore County, you said that they may be able to do that. Has that practice, has it, has it actually occurred? Because it sounds like there's a lot of, I don't want to say limitations, but it doesn't sound realistically that has happened. Has, has anyone actually requested you been able to implement it? Because like again, you said you, you could be able to do it, but have you actually been able to do it? Our policy allows for it. Right. I am not aware that it has ever been done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gabe, in, in Hartford County, um, we do not transport any non-public school children. Uh, the general ed buses are all contractor owned. The school system runs all the special needs buses. Um, but the private schools that we have in Hartford County, they do have some of their own buses uh, and they do have one contractor that they're contracted with, but um, they're not, none, no, none of them are transported on uh, general ed bus for the school system. Thank you, Steve. Uh, understand. Uh, Mr. Clark. My question is also a follow up to uh, Mr. West and to, to Steve. That was Steve Nelson, I think, um, in Hartford County. Um, do you guys do outreach to these uh, non public schools to, to let them know, like, hey, we do allow this, or is this just something that is I guess in your in your charter that you allow it and and those parents that are interested have to reach out to you to say, hey, my kid is going to this school, you know, do you have capacity on your service for my child? Um, in Harford County, we do not offer that at all. Uh, if, if they they either have to drive them themselves or like I say, the one school has a, a few of its own buses and there is one contractor uh in the county and he does the private schools but that's all he does he does not have any public school contract um so that it's it's 
two different entities all together. If, if you want to contract with the private school, that is all on you. Hartford County does not intermingle with it at all. If I'm, uh, hopefully I answered that clear. You did, thank you. Good afternoon, it's Kenny West again. Um, no, Mr. Clark, we do not currently do any outreach to the schools, the, the variety of schools within and around Baltimore County. Thank you. All right. Um, I know we have uh, Ms. Ann Wagner on, on this uh, task force, and, and Ms. Wagner is uh, the uh, head of schools at uh, the Banner School. And I believe in conversation with her that they do not have transportation, but I wanted to kind of hear from you, Ms. Wagner. Uh, has transportation been a conversation with your staff or, or with parents? Uh, and how does your school kind of deal with those issues of, of getting private school students to and from school? Uh, great question. Um, I The school has a 40-year history, so there have been times in the past when the school has had sufficient uh, uh, availability and interest in, uh, to uh, provide uh, bus, local buses, uh, you know, our own buses to pick up students, but we don't presently do that. Um, you know, I think, I think like anything, it's an additional cost to families. And so they have to weigh the cost of, you know, us providing public transportation versus um, providing the transportation themselves. So as it stands, our families uh, bring their children to and from school every day. All right. Thank you. And I think we, we talked a little bit about the costs of transportation that uh, the non-public schools are dealing with. Is there uh, any data that anyone's aware of on what an average cost of transportation for a non-public school student is uh, or what it costs to provide that transportation? Since we have data on what it might cost to transport public school students, I am not aware of any data on what it may cost uh, our non-public school parents uh, to transport students or how much it would cost for a program to be run by a school system itself. Yeah, Mr. Sadwin. Yeah, this, we've seen a range of, uh, you know, it depends on on a number of variety of factors. We, you know, when we were having this conversation a number of months ago, we actually reached out to some companies just to try to get a, you know, a ballpark figure and what the ballpark figures are in terms of what they pay in other states. And it, there was a range from about you know, it's it, it ranges probably like like nine hundred to a thousand dollars a year per student to fifteen hundred or more. Excuse me. So it, it, there's a range, and it's based on a you know very wide variety of factors. No, thank you. That gives me a, a better understanding. Uh, Mr. Coderman. Yes, Mr. At, at the beginning, when you were talking about the funding as far as for public schools and how the funding is determined, you referenced a couple of different, you know, codes as far as for each uh, jurisdiction, you know, that each jurisdiction is afforded, you know, uh, you know, funding for that. Is it, I guess, two part question. One, what is that amount? So, like, is it, how is it determined? Is it like X amount of dollars per pupil? And then does that vary? Regarding the jurisdiction, like is it the same in Washington County versus St. Mary's County, and et cetera? So I'm happy to answer that one. Uh, the funding amount is annualized in law. It is not wealth equalized. It's entirely state share. It is a per people amount that's adjusted by the CPI transportation index each year. And so that amount is applied uh, and it's by per student. So each district, each jurisdiction gets an amount per pupil. So we take the number of eligible students times that per pupil amount, and that's essentially what you're looking at. Uh, we do two, that formula gets run twice, essentially, once for transported students, one for disabled student transportation counts, but uh, it's all awarded together in the transportation grants down to the local education agencies. As the year, as far as the administration of that goes, Senator, just to, to give you kind of the full end to end, uh, that's part of uh, our state aid calculations. So when you look at, or uh, when you see the aid to education budget, for example, state aid, uh, transportation is a part of that. It's administered in uh, six bi-monthly payments throughout the, the year. And the school districts retain those funds. And so the other thing to note here is that they are restricted to transportation. Even if they do retain them year to year, they can't go back into their general fund balance. They have to be 
uh, continue to be used on transportation services only. Um, but that I think hopefully answers your your question there. Does it does it vary from the jurisdiction, or just the same across the board, like the per pupil amount? So the per pupil, well. Um, in transportation aid specifically, which is 5218 uh, of the uh, art education article, the per pupil amount does not vary by jurisdiction. However, um, there is another part of state aid formula, the, which is now under the blueprint, the comprehensive wage index. Uh -huh. Thank you, Laura, mute. Oh, sorry about that. The comprehensive wage index does provide uh, an adjustment for districts that have higher than average market basket of costs. And so, you know, some jurisdictions get supplemental aid in another part of the formula to adjust for local costs. That's not though specifically tied to transportation. It's a broader adjustment, but that is part of the concept of that portion of the state aid formula. All right, and last question. Do we know what the per pupil cost is currently? Did I miss that earlier? You did not, but I have the sheet in front of me if you'll give me one second. So for fiscal 24, the school year starting, it is pardon me. Increase. Sure, you'll have to pardon me. I've got this. Uh, it's not really available. You can I, it. I can pull it to give you the other one. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Justin. And we'll make sure that we get that information uh, to the group then uh, after this meeting before our next as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, any other Thoughts, or um, I know we don't. We only have, I think, two members of our uh, public school represented here. I didn't know if we had anyone from Baltimore City or Montgomery that were able to join to talk about how their public school system might be able to accommodate uh, non-public school students. It doesn't sound like anyone else has been able to join. So hopefully, at the next time that we have our meeting, uh, we'll get representatives from Baltimore City and Montgomery that can add into this discussion uh, to understand um, more so on how. A public school system, as Mr. West talked about, might have policies that uh, involve students to be incorporated into existing routes or, or what their uh, their county policies are. Uh, but I wanted to kind of go around and see if there's any other thoughts uh, or questions regarding this before we move on. All right. Not hearing anything. Um, we are doing... Uh, well on time. We have done a pretty significant uh, overview of school transportation in Maryland. Uh, hopefully we're able to provide information that kind of sets the groundwork for us working moving forward. Uh, this meeting was intended to be kind of an introduction, uh, to start the discussion and to start um, thinking about options and considerations um, moving forward. Uh, again, the task force's goal is to provide uh, recommendations uh, to the General Assembly for this upcoming legislative session. Um, so we are going to be providing recommendations in some form or fashion, um, regardless uh, at the completion of these four meetings. So, um, Mr. O'Day, I see your hand. I want to say this was an incredibly thorough meeting. Thank you so much for organizing and having it so well organized. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. O'Day. Glad to have you on as well. Um, and for the information you've all been able to provide, uh, this has been a collection of, of information thoughts, and we'll be using this meeting to set the groundwork for our next <coughs> our next uh, meeting. <coughs> so in preparation for our next meeting, which we talked about was September 14th, I wanted to uh, ask the group if there's any outside members that we would like to have uh, present information that would be relevant to uh, the interests of the group. Um, I think we talked about outreaching to uh, MCPS's gentleman who is overseeing the pilot program. Um, we will 
ask our two members from Baltimore City and Montgomery to see if they can attend so we can hear from the public school's perspective on that. Uh, we do have um, a representative from the comptroller's office who will attend the September 14th meeting and provide an understanding of, um, I think, as Delegate Attar uh, talked about briefly in the beginning, uh, sort of tax incentive uh, with uh, non-public school transportation. Um, but I'd like to ask the group before we wrap up today, is there anything that uh, you as a member of the group would like ahead of the September meeting um, that would help you in the uh, process of making recommendations or understanding more? I think uh, Senator Colderman will, will provide the information on the funding per, per pupil. Um, that's one thing that we'll get to you, as well as uh, outreach to those three states that we identified, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York, that have similar programs, just so I have that information. But uh, for the group, is there anything that uh, we'd like ahead of the next meeting uh, for all of us to uh, review or evaluate? Not hearing anything, it sounds like our work is still going to be, uh, we still have some work done behind the scenes for everyone, uh, so that when we meet again uh, in September, uh, we will be talking more about the uh, finance side, uh, the costs of uh, any recommendation that is provided, uh, but this sets the groundwork for us to move forward um, as a group. Uh, so I wanted to... Uh, touch base one last time. I don't know if uh, Mr. Krishna Talor is, is still on the line. He may have had to leave. I think we had some people jump off, but um, at this point, we are nearing the completion. Uh, our next meeting is set for September 14th, uh, 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, the link, like I said, is going to be different from the link that we all use today, so make sure you check your calendars, and I'll send out a reminder ahead of time just so we can all join, um, but I'll do one last call for any uh, last topics or, or questions before we conclude our meeting today. All right. And with that, uh, we, we will start working on recommendations uh, and provide a draft to the group as well, based upon some of the things that we talked about today. Uh, so I want to make sure, again, everyone has a voice. Everyone has an opportunity to talk and discuss. We don't want anyone to feel left out in these meetings. So I appreciate the work that you're all doing to uh, keep us informed and provide recommendations to us. Um, but if there's anything that comes up uh, in between now and our next meeting, please email, me, email myself. I'll make sure I get the information that you need and we'll respond in a timely manner. Um, but thank you all for participating today. Thank you for your interest in the subject. And we look forward to talking with you all again uh, next month. So with that, thank you, everyone, and have a good uh, start of the year, a uh, school year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.